history of of uh, Southern Africa film. And I'll just say a couple of words about Simon and what I know of him. And then I'll hand over to him and he's going to do a presentation for us of around 25 minutes. And then we'll open it to the floor for a discussion. Okay, so I first met Simon quite a long time ago now, when I think about it, on the campus of WITS, when he was looking to find people who'd be interested in his project. About. And I was really pleased to get to know him and his work. I think that my meeting probably coincided roughly, Simon, with your completion of your film that you directed called Robert Mugabe, What Happened? And I thought this was, I think that was the first thing of yours I watched. And I was really impressed because it was a very complex of Robert Mugabe and it used extensive archival footage which really went to my heart as a historian. And a few years after that some of us founded a project which is jointly hosted by the History Workshop and by the Witt School of Arts as well as the Market Photo Workshop and this project is called Reframing Africa and it's about it started with that desire to try and persuade people to look after and value the film archives and you know, our ambitions were quite expansive. We imagined, you know, throughout Africa, that's what we were really trying to reach to convince people of how precious those film archives are. And Simon became a firm supporter of that project and also a participant in it. And uh, where I just have to do, sorry, commercial break. We're about to launch our first book from that project. If you can see the cover, of it, it's called Reframing Africa, question mark, Reflections on Modernity and the Moving Image. It's going to be launched on the 31st of May by the History Workshop. And so you shall come. It's going to be a hybrid event. So those of you in Joburg can actually get real refreshments and so on. But we'll tell you about that later on. OK, so um, Simon did send a bio with the invitation to the seminar. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of things from that bio. So um, you'll see that he has an MA from Reading where he studied media and communication in rural development. And subsequently, he was employed by the Zimbabwean Ministry of Agriculture to produce training videos and plans. In 1985, he established Zim Media with Ingrid Sinclair, who I see is here. And he's going to tell us short as well as talking about broader developments. He's going to tell us the untold story, or some of it anyway. I think he's going to try and attract people to join him in the film festival. And he also produced the Pan Africa Mama series of films, winning awards at uh, FESPACO, which is the Pan African Federation of Filmmakers, Cannes, and Rotterdam. And in 1993, he was engaged to develop curricula for the UNESCO Southern African Regional Film Training Project, also with Ingrid Sinclair. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to Simon to do his presentation. And thanks so much, Simon. Really looking forward to it. Thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction, Cynthia. And thanks very much to the History Workshop, which I um, feel very honoured to be invited to speak at. Um, I think it's a wonderful institution. And good afternoon. So this paper is a, a rethinking of the origins and history of Southern African cinema, which up to now has been uncomfortably squeezed by the academic literature into the frame of separate national cinemas. It's based on my experience as a filmmaker, researching archives, reading Pan-African cinema manifestos and recording interviews with fellow filmmakers. I am a member of the Pan-African generation of filmmakers as well. It's based on my experience as a filmmaker researching archives. Sorry. Of course, in this short seminar, I can only tell a small part of the history of transnational Southern African cinema. So I will focus on two films and illustrate them with film clips. I'll point to the, the conceptual continuities between Pan-African cinema manifestos of the 1960s and the meetings and festivals beginning in 1970, continuing in Harare and ending in Cape Town. 
I'll briefly refer to SACOD, the region-wide association which stimulated film collaboration between Southern African countries in the 1990s and early 2000s. During the 1980s, as many of you will know, South Africa was paying millions of rand to keep a steady flow of apartheid propaganda, fake news, flowing to newspapers, television and radio in the West. Some com commentators have referred to this use of media as media as a weapon of war. The apartheid regime was determined to stave off economic sanctions and the embargo against buying military equipment it needed for its wars against its neighbors, the frontline states. To help you appreciate the context of the time, here is a description of the global media environment taken from the 1980 UNESCO McBride report. It said, due to the fact that the content of media information is mostly produced by the main developed countries, the image of developing countries is frequently false and distorted. Through that control of media channels, the West dominated the narrative, distorting and falsifying stories from the South, including the story of Southern Africa. Just to give you some context, after the revolution in 1975, Mozambique was desperately short of skilled workers and had low levels of literacy. The Mozambican Minister of Information, Jorge Rebelo, wanted to use film to communicate friendly policies to its population and to document the unfolding history of his new country. So he recruited cooperant filmmakers from all over the world to help establish a National Cinema Institute. This led to transnational filmmaker exchanges and training with politically sympathetic filmmakers like Jean-Luc Godard from France, as well as filmmakers from Canada, the United Kingdom, Cuba, Serbia and Brazil coming to Mozambique. These volunteers meant that Mozambican filmmakers were shaped by a very rich and very wide range of cinematic influences. This included the third cinema movement, social realist documentary movement and the ideas of early Soviet cinema. Mozambique became the go-to place for progressive and pan-African filmmakers. The first Pan-African Film Conference in Southern Africa, as I said, was held in Maputo, and it was based on the work of earlier Pan-African conferences held in Algiers. Meanwhile, as you know, in 1980, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. Realizing the biased view of most Western media, Mozambican and Angolan filmmakers worked together to produce the documentary film, Pamberi Ne Zimbabwe, a transnational production made by four different nationalities and financed by Angola, Mozambique, and Libya. Pumped to the newly independent state of Zimbabwe. Angola and Mozambique knew that no Western or Rhodesian crew could do justice to the story of the end of 15 years of war as Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. The film captures the drama of the 1979 ceasefire between the Rhodesian army and the guerrilla forces of Zanda and Zipra. Pamberi is the film that inspired me to make my first film. And so I'd like to share it with you and for you to have a taste of it. The clip I'm going to show shows you the point of ceasefire with Mugabe's forces and then Nkomo and his forces in their separate assembly camps. It's a tense moment. A tiny contingent of Rhodesian soldiers face 2,000 armed freedom fighters. 
heard the rumble from the crowd as the ceasefire is debated. They are dancing, of course, with live ammunition. I wish to assure you that the support we have, we will not put to ill use. We will use in order to further the, the objectives of the Lancaster House Agreement so that we proceed to elections and our people can vote Zanu into power. We as soldiers can stop this war, and that is why we have come today so that we can start to build a trust between the Zanla forces and the Rhodesian security forces. As one nation, without any distinction of color or creed, they become. Today, that which we fought for has, I believe, been accomplished. The war being over, it is essential that you and those against whom you fought should now come and work together. I know that a number of things happened during the war, very unpleasant things. But those against whom you fought were, in fact, the people of your own country. The conference in London has brought a new constitution, a new constitution that accepts that we are a people together. I'm very grateful to your commander-in-chief for asking me to come along and to see you today. Now, as your commander-in-chief has said to you, we fought each other. That is history. Let this be a good start to our future together. It's a wonderful country. Let us together make it the best one in the world. I don't mind what it's called, because it's such a damn good place. So I say to you, Bamberi, near Zimbabwe.
For me, that clip brilliantly captures the fragility and emotion of the piece that came. It's very powerful filmmaking. And I realized from it two key things. Firstly, that I wanted to work with Angolan and Mozambican film crews. And secondly, that a crew from one from more than one country in the region could work together to make an excellent film. You must remember that most experienced filmmakers in Zimbabwe in 1980 had worked for the propaganda arm of the Rhodesian government. And so I needed to reach out to neighbors in the struggle, Angola and Mozambique, to find the creative team to make the anti-apartheid film I wanted to make. By 1984, the Zimbabwean government had not yet developed a coherent film policy. And us aspirant filmmakers had very little experience. We were the face for the problem of how to create a new film industry. So we invited Pan-African filmmakers to a workshop in Harare to share their knowledge. The great filmmaker Jibril Mambeti came from the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers. Pedro Pimenta came from Mozambique. And the Ethiopian filmmaker Haile Garima came from the US. They helped us to write a communique, which was effectively a to-do list for our new industry. And the key recommendation was to create a film workers association. So the Zimbabwe Film and Video Association was set up in 1984, chaired by the late great Stephen Chifunise and his deputy Stephen Chigurimbo. Another key recommendation was to organize a festival of African cinema in Harare, since until that time, no one had seen any African films, but more of the festival later. Meanwhile, we also needed to make some films. So in 1985, Zim Media, my production company, was formed with Ingrid Sinclair. Our first production was the anti-apartheid documentary, Corridors of Freedom. We took a different approach from most anti-apartheid films of the time. Instead of focusing on victims of South Africa's war on its own people and the region, we felt the story needed to be told of successful resistance. We wanted to show the resistance of the frontline states, and we wanted to show ourselves and the world that apartheid would lose the battle for Southern Africa, as it did. I'm now going to play a short clip from Corridors of Freedom. It's not the most dramatic sequence in my film, but I've chosen the clip what it shows you about regional integration and how this gave strength. In the 1960s, the struggles for majority rule by countries in southern Africa bore fruit. Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi, Botswana, Lesotho and Swaziland all gained their independence. During the 70s, Angola and Mozambique were liberated after bitter years of armed struggle. And in 1980, so was Zimbabwe, thus completing the bloc of black majority ruled independent states. They immediately formed SADC, the Southern African Development Coordination Conference. They knew that cooperation was the strongest form of resistance to the stranglehold South Africa has over the region. The case for SADC actually goes back to the mid-70s, 
And I can recall President Kaunda wishing at that time that a belt of independent states stretching from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean would constitute a band of countries in the struggle. No longer the struggle for political independence, but the struggle for economic liberation. For the countries of Sadiq, there is neither help nor charity, and we do not want them. What exists are interests. It is economic interests that move different countries. The northern industrial countries are going to Angola because they want oil, diamonds, and coffee. In Zimbabwe, they want chrome and gold. In Swaziland, they want iron and coal. Our natural resources are targets and therefore they are also tools for cooperation and not for aid. Therefore, we should not wait for aid, but rather for cooperation. On April the 1st, 1980, the leaders of the nine Sadiq countries met in the Zambian capital of Lusaka. What I'd like to point out about this clip is that much of the black and white movie archive comes from the National Film Institute in Mozambique and public TV in Angola. The stills that you saw, those marvelous stills, are by the late Kok Nam, personal photographer to the Mozambican president, Samora Michel. The cameraman were Jao Costa from Mozambique and Carlos Enriquez from Angola. And the sound recordist was Gabriel Mondlane. In other words, the same crew that filmed Pamberi in Zimbabwe. The production was managed by Martin Mahandor from Tanzania. I was the director and Ingrid Sinclair was the producer. Five different nationalities made this film with support in kind or finance from eight different countries clearly making Corridors another Southern African transnational film. The idea of combining film crews came initially from an ideological principle. I thought that the first film about Southern Africa should be made by a regionally representative crew. But co-production also was the problem of the shortage of skilled filmmakers in our newly independent countries and the scarcity of funds for making films. By combining the best filmmakers from the region with local and international investment, I believed we could make a film that would be very, very widely screened. As a filmmaker working on my first international television documentary, filmed in 16 millimeter in several war zones to add to the complications, was dependent on the skills and experience of my crew. So collaborating across cultures and national boundaries meant we were able to get permits to film in places where no one else could film. For example, the Kambinda oil enclave in Angola and the Zimbabwean military convoys along the Tet Road in Mozambique. Collaboration was key. <clears throat> no single <clears throat> country in Southern Africa had the equipment, skills, or finance to sustain a film industry driven solely by its own nationals. In addition to the spread of funding and contacts enabled by transnational co-production, it led to more successful distribution. Corridors were screened throughout the SADC countries, wherever there was television, and on mobile cinema in Mozambique, it showed on TV in Channel 4 UK. It was sold to Nordic television and European televisions from East Germany, stretching right across Europe to the Atlantic and to WNET New York. This transnational approach drove the successful distribution of Southern African films that followed. The 1984 meeting we had in Harare had produced a resolution to establish an African film festival to complement FESPACO in Burkina Faso and the JCC in Tunisia. 
and I was tasked with raising funds for what became the first Frontline Film Festival. A planning session in Maputo was attended by both government officials and filmmakers from Tanzania, Mozambique, Angola and Zimbabwe. The festival took place in Harare in 1990 and it was directed very ably by Linda Mbuzi and was attended by many of the great names of African cinema, including Gaston Cabare from Burkina Faso, Suleiman Sisse from Mali, Mambete from Senegal, together with filmmakers from other Salak region countries. <laughs> from South Africa, the ANC and PAC sent representatives, as well as independent filmmakers from FAWO, the Film and Allied Workers Organization. Excluded by the apartheid system, from seeing any Pan-African cinema, South African filmmakers were introduced to a vision of the rest of Africa through cinema, many of them for the first time. We screened classic films like Yelene and Halfoween, as well as our own films. Marcel Dioff from the Organization of African Unity awarded the prize for best documentary to my film. I'm bearing it in, I'm sorry, Imperial Music Spirit of the People, of which I'm very proud. The festival's final communique repeated and refined earlier Pan African resolutions and outlined the steps we would take over the coming years to develop the collaboration between filmmakers and governments across different African nations. The first Frontline Film Festival was followed by three more, more Southern African film festivals and the first African input conference in 1993. For a time, it seemed that the Southern African Film Festival would become the third Pan-African Film Festival after Fes Bako and Karkaj. Directors and producers from the Maghreb, as well as the new wave of West African directors, then started coming to film in Zimbabwe. Idrissa Wadriago from Burkina Faso shot Kini and Adams, Jean-Pierre Becolo from Cameroon shot Aristotle's plot. Hussein Palsi came from Martinique with a Hollywood budget to make dry white season. And Raoul Peck from Haiti filmed Lumumba. These encounters opened a rich slate of filmmaking to our view. Combining influences from North, West and Southern Africa, differences of language and culture and nationality were no, no barriers to the creativity. One of the organizations instrumental in nurturing and stimulating this phase of transnational filmmaking was set up in the late 1980s. Capricorn Video in Harare and Video News Services in South Africa formed SACOD, initially to show the internal resistance being played out on the streets violently of South African townships. It became part of the regional media war with key members, with a key member, the Film Resources Unit, achieving some remarkable feats of distribution at the time. One small example is that Corridors of Freedom was being shown on video screens in township Shabines across South Africa, even under apartheid. But there are many, many more stories than that. SACOD grew to include 78 companies and individuals from most of the 50 countries of the SEC. There was an annual workshop which was held in different countries each year where filmmakers from the region gathered to critique each other's work, share knowledge about funding, and make up production teams from different nations. This collaborative period gave rise to many cross-border and cross-cultural productions over a period of 20 years. Series like Africa Dreaming, Mama Africa, dramas like Neria and Flame were a few of the prize-winning series and movies that came out of this time and were distributed internationally and within the region, thanks to FRU, Film Resources Unit. The, the Sitengi film market in Cape Town became the next meeting and screening hub of the cinema after Harare. But then SACOD was closed down in 2006 because of funding issues. 
and the Southern African transnational cinema movement faltered in the face of growing nationalism within the region. Gabriel Mondelein, coordinator of the Mozambican Film Workers Association, described the ethos. Those days, he said, we knew each other's project because we discussed them at Input, SACOT, at the festivals. So we discussed films and helped by criticizing them. We helped directors to improve their stories before they raised money, before they began shooting. More people <clears throat> There's no trust between us because we have no space to defend, to develop friendships or brotherhood. Uh, I should say sisterhood as well. Um, I am embarking now on a Southern African archive project with regional partners to digitize many of the key documents and films from this period. of recovering such history is that it forms a record of how filmmaking developed and broadened its base, despite an environment distorted by the gross inequality of apartheid and racism. Given the wealth of unseen archive available, the Southern African transnational cinema movement would make an excellent research project, I suggest, for researchers, aspiring PhD students, or anybody who wants it. And I'm very happy to point you in the direction of myself and other people who can give you access to these archives. Uh, I'd like to um, pose a question to you. Decolonizing the colonial archive is a focus of much current academic work, certainly here at the University of Bristol, for example. Surely a way to, to put the divide and rule of colonial film archive in its place or into perspective is to use these archives to bring to life the stories of African transformation and integration. <clears throat> well, I've enjoyed and benefited enormously from creatively working with and across national boundaries and cultures. And I believe there may be still lessons to be learned from this history. Regional integration <clears throat> has given away to narrow nationalism in many parts of the world today. In the countries of Southern Africa, xenophobia is rife, despite the historical interdependence which bound our countries together to overcome apartheid. I will end up by saying that by working transnationally, we were moving towards what the Jamaican sociologist Stuart Hall once called a new concept of ethnicity and cultural politics, which engages rather than suppresses difference. And I think some good films came out of this. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to discussing with you now. Thanks very much, Simon. That was great. I hope that many people will accept your invitation to do research on this field. And uh, I think it would you just make me feel, I suppose, a false nostalgia because I wasn't there for the exciting days that you describe and rubbing shoulders with some of the great filmmakers and engaged in this regional project um, in what someone you quoted described as a more important and more interesting time. Sometimes it feels like that. Um, I think that you made your point well about what a powerful medium Phil is, film is through your showing of the clip from Pambeiri, Zimbabwe. It certainly makes that point. You can tell us as much as you know, people who are dancing with live ammunition, it makes nothing like the impact is when you see that clip and you feel that knife edge tension. So I think I'm just going to say, try and highlight what I think your arguments are here, but then. Um, so I think that you're saying um, 
why it's important to tell this history of transnational cooperation. And uh, that's something that, you know, we've actually talked about quite a lot at our Reframing Africa conferences, is how does one write the history and then we just, maybe it's African cinemas. Um, but that still doesn't get to really the point that I think you're trying to make is that one of the impediments in writing a history of African cinema, which doesn't really exist yet, is that we always tend to think of it in national terms. We have to somehow break out of that for various reasons, which you started to tell us about. Yeah, yeah so um, thanks very much. I think you gave us a lot to think about. Let's see if anybody else wants to ask a question or make a comment. Um, will you just raise your hands if you do? And you can use the chat function as well. Here we are. We have a, a comment from Kasonde. I'll just read it while everyone else gets their ideas in order. So he says, thank you for the fascinating seminar. Oh, yes, this is a very good question. Could you speak a little more about the state of the archives? I was actually thinking of asking you that myself. Um, so uh, Kasonde says that from his understanding, the national broadcaster in Zambia's archives are in a dismal state. A lot of the materials that were produced by ZBS, its predecessors, and the successor S ZNBC have been destroyed. And how do you overcome such challenges? What are your ideas? And where would this archive that you're talking about be hosted? Maybe you should go ahead and answer that, and then I'll see if anyone else wants to ask questions. Well, this, uh, the state of archives <coughs> varies enormously from different country to different country. In mm. Mozambique, for example, although Mozambicans would want it to improve, there's actually a good um, amount of the film has been digitized, always more needs to be done. In Zimbabwe, they have a great program at the National Archives of Zimbabwe of digitizing the film archive. But um, nobody knows about it. And I, as a filmmaker, have a concern that since, that as long as people don't know that these archives exist, um, they might as well um, not exist. And very soon they won't exist. So one of the drums that I'm beating as loudly as I can is that we should get together <clears throat> and create uh, possibly a website or some other kind of instrument which publicizes to ourselves and to the whole world the rich <clears throat> the richness of archives as a region now some of those archives will be particular to zambia to tanzania and to zimbabwe and some of them will be um transnational and have transnational implications. But if you have such an archive, then uh, uh, such, a, such a website, such a, a medium of information, firstly, you're raising the profile of archive, the importance of archive. You're more likely to attract funding to enable people to digitize those archives. Um, and they will be used. And the kind of, I suggest that the stakeholders in this would be um, obviously filmmakers, you see that I've used a lot of archive, I've always used archive as Cynthia mentioned also in the Mugabe film um, and so filmmakers because of materials who as Cynthia said put people into the frame of what it was like to be in an assembly point in 1979 in the bush over towards the Mozambican border. You know, nothing, no words can actually convey that moment like that piece of film does. Um, so I see at the archivists themselves. So I sort of see it as a kind of tripartite, if you like. Um, other people, of course, but um, that could be a good start. Does that answer the question? Yes, I, I think it answers the question. Um, Simon Kosonde says that, you know, he points out that some of the archival material that he's thinking of has actually been destroyed. Is there anything to be done under those circumstances? No, what's gone is gone. All you can do is not look back, 
look forward and just try and preserve what remains uh, uh, because uh, that will also get destroyed if we don't start working now. And publicity, I think, giving raising the profile as you do with reframing Africa, as we are doing thanks to BITS History Workshop, is um, all part of that work. Um, and, you know, hopefully some some um, new generation or next generation scholars will, will perceive um, the opportunity to contribute significantly to, to new knowledge by, um, by, 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 by creating a, a new narrative of, um, of Southern African cinema about a story which, uh, which itself will also disappear if we don't, uh, if we don't do more writing about it. Okay, thanks. I'm looking for some questions and comments from other people. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Simon. Hi. Oh, hi, Emma. Emma Sander. Yeah, um, sorry, sorry not to put my hand up and ask. I couldn't get the reaction thing working. So um, I've just put, 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 put it in here. Um, thanks very much for that essential transnational um, input there, Simon. Interesting work. That you've been involved with along with uh, many colleagues from Zimbabwe and across uh, the southern eastern nations as you say in a transnational way. I just wonder with the archive story there's a lot going on in terms of initiatives here there and everywhere reframing Africa is aware of as well um, such as the within um, uh, uh, Germany the kind of Berlin Arsenal archive but also uh, Docs, which is um, Jihan, Jihan's um, work there on archives, but also um, Abu Bakar Sanago has spoken at Reframing Africa in terms of the restoration program. And I suppose in that way, FESPACO has always had a transnational um, approach in some ways, even if it's not always enacted out. And there's a bit of a, um, has been a francophone emphasis on, on, on the history of FESPACO. Um, but it might be that some of the things you're saying about the urgency of creating uh, networks around archives and the need to uh, think uh, not only transnationally about where a lot of the archive sits and whether it's even accessible, um, but in terms of, um, you know, spreading around the urgency of ar archives in somewhere like Zambia or in um, Ghana, um, also, you know, the initiation, the initiative um, in Zimbabwe that not many people know the digitization programs taking place. I think this is all extremely important um, things that you're, you're arguing. And it feels that there are networks that need to be uh, tightened up and everyone's so busy with their own projects. <laughs> it's hard to make those happen. Um, but I wondered if you would like to address a little bit um, where else you're going to do, uh, you've published your paper, where else you're going to be talking, if you thought of um, approaching like Frankfurt University, where they are hosting quite a lot of these discussions uh, about archive and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, just to put that. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, that's a useful uh, overview of what's going on in the rest of the world as well. And thanks for your suggestions. I mean, that's like a game from this seminar. Um, I didn't know about the Frankfurt. I know about Jihan, of course. And I was last year or year before talking extensively with Abu Bakar about the uh, FEPASI initiatives on archive. Um, so, yeah, I'm in total agreement. Uh, I suppose. The Southern African um, story is particular because of the politics of the way liberation played out there um, with the frontline states. Uh, and so I don't think it's an accident that the filmmakers then took their cue from that political environment. Um, and so that pre presents a kind of discrete unit for us to be able of bite as chunk were. But we do need to make 
we need to connect connect it up with all the other organizations. And so I'd love it if you would um, send me some email recommendations, Emma, and we can take it up and, um, and uh, think about ways of, um, of, of bringing, you know, a ton and tow, but then maybe just bringing together different archives um, as you've announced, as you've described them, Emma, um, to talk about uh, uh, collab ways in which they could collaborate. So just come back in, Cynthia, but yeah, thanks, Simon. I'd, you know, in a way, Reframing Africa has started that. You know, you've had John O'Confro, you've had a whole section on archives. If our ab worker comes regularly, there are those um, circuits there within bits and um, reframing Africa. It, it may be that this is this is a place to kind of start thinking about what reframing Africa has actually done so far and what, how those networks might um, continue. Um, at the moment in London, there's a, a big exhibition of the June Giovanni Pan African Cinema Archive, to which Abu Boko and others, um, Gaston Kabor and others are are attending over the next over this month which I'll certainly send you that material um, and so these discussions are quite upfront obviously in London and in the, in, in, in Germany in certain countries uh, probably even in Portugal in terms of archive initiatives that they're talking about so you kind of feel that the, the IFIAF the Federation International Archives are not actually posting these things then somehow we need to create the networks to to do uh, some of that and um, that uh, and of course is a very important person in terms of um, networking like that certainly across uh, North and um, West Africa yeah Louis? sorry uh, yeah I think that's great thanks Emma we have to think about how to activate more of the circuits and I mean that has always been our intention in reframing Africa. Um, and I think you're giving us encouragement to really get it together on that front. <laughs> so thanks. And um, Simon, did you want to say something? No, accepting. I fully uh, endorse that. Um, and um, Reframing Africa in the past has uh, given me the opportunity to be interviewed by Abu Bakar regarding Pamberi. Um, and so this is, for me, the next step where, um, you know, I come out with a more full well, proposal of a, a particular story with a kind of a bite-sized chunk of history and coherence. Um, so, yeah, um, we're already seeing some gains from this work. Thank you. And have you spoken to Abu Bakr about Southern Africa in particular, because the Russian project seemed to me to be just I think someone made this point on um, other parts. Of, I think it was Emma who said, you know, we had Francophone, quite a lot of emphasis on Francophone cinema and restoration of those films. Is there any is there any interest in kind of restoring some of the films from this part of the world? Um, well, I was in quite intensive discussions with Abu Bakr before um, COVID struck um, and um, haven't heard from him since. But I alerted him to the seminar um, so I guess he's he's busy with other things, um, but um, yeah, I mean, very happy to talk to anybody who um, you know would like to facilitate this process. Um, uh, as my paper suggests, this story um, um, was kind of has been buried, and it's time to unbury the story. I think. And that's what we're doing. That's great. I'm sure Abu Bakr is sleeping at the moment because he lives in Canada, but <laughs> he is going to come back this way sometime. So perhaps we can pick up a conversation with him then. Okay, yeah. just a couple of things appearing in the chat. So Alan, uh, referring back to the question that Kasunde asked, said um, we missed out or he didn't hear, where will this archive be housed? So Simon, perhaps you can address that. Okay, just address that quickly and then we'll go on to the other things. Uh, I think that the archive needs to remain in the countries of origin um, under the current custodianship of whoever's looking after them. 
Uh, I think if you tried to do anything else, it would be um, a political incident. Um, and uh, rightly, they should remain in their countries. And we can't talk about, you know, returning the Elgin marbles to Greece and then take uh, all the archive away from uh, from Zambia. Um, but the great thing about digitization is you can make copies uh, and you can improve those copies. So I think that the control of the marketing of the archive should remain with the national custodians of that archive. Again, because I think politically it'd be impossible to do anything else, but also it's appropriate. But obviously those custodians need to be given support in terms of you know how to market it what appropriate you know basically how to, how to create accessible marketable archive which can then help to fund the restoration of further archive um that's why i think you know this idea of a website which indicates the potential maybe with short degraded clips which couldn't be um copy stolen um essentially you have to have there's two sides to this question there's the preserving of the archive which is absolutely no nice if you don't have the publicity the storytelling and the storytelling is filmmakers making use of the archive it's academics making use of the archive academics writing about concepts like transnational southern african cinema um, if you don't have a story, you know, the West African story is a wonderful story. It's very powerful. It's very well told. Um, people say, you know, the hidden, lost, stolen, you know, mysterious films of West Africa. Actually, that story is very well covered. But the Southern African story, nobody is writing about it. So, and I'm firmly believe that, um, and I'm sure as a historian you'll appreciate this, Cynthia, that unless you have a story, unless you have a history, there is no history. Um, yeah. Thanks, that's great. Very helpful and inspiring words there. Um, now just going back to Emma, she pointed out that Mapunsula has been restored recently. Emma, do you want to quickly tell us about it in a minute? I don't think there's anything really to say other than, you know, through the uh, Booker's um, work with the uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, World Cinema uh, Restoration Project, um, that that has been one that has been restored through, I think it's through Bologna, but... I'm not sure of the full story of, of that. Okay, well, thanks for bringing it to our attention. I'll definitely follow up on that one. And then Katerina Sima pointed out to us, well, thanking Simon. I was going to go through these quickly because now we're coming to the end, people are starting to talk. So she wants to thank Simon and she's drawing our attention to the Arsenal Archive Assembly in Berlin, preparing a website called Filmmap which is mapping the film archives on all continents. So that's very exciting. It's definitely a project to be in contact with. And then Mpo Denchua says, hi, Simon, thanks for the insightful presentation. So there you've got one of your takers, I think, Simon, because he would like to have a chat with you regarding the platform and the new narrative for Southern Africa. That's really exciting. And Linda Mvuzi he says thank you and your shout out to triple to quadruple F and compliment to my able directing of first frontline film festival. That's really nice. I also see film friends from those 1990 days like Kaplan and Hello. And okay, then he talks about the successes of FFFF and the willingness of SADC countries and indeed the OAU countries to de-link national archives and make it a common pan-African resource fed by and resources by individual filmmakers without fiat or patronage by governments. So that's a, points out a really interesting consideration. And uh, Linda goes on to say, uh, spent an inordinate amount of resources bypassing governments to reach individual filmmakers in 53 countries and arranging independent monies to recover films and reproduce existing films regardless of politics. Okay, so they're all very valuable comments. Um, Simon, would you like to say anything in response to any of those? 
Um, I'd like to ask, well, Paul, um, get in touch. Very happy to help you if you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah, great. Thanks for stepping in to organize all those years back. Uh, I think I realized after the time that we were lucky to have you. Um, and I didn't quite follow all the detail of the point that you made. So perhaps you could send me an email separately um, uh, and then I could, you know, uh, see you know, more clearly. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks to Katarina. Um, and as it's a small band of um, of brothers so far, we hope some sisters will join us um, in the Southern African Transnational Project. Um, so, Katarina, maybe you could um, explore the links with this uh, movement in Germany that you're, I think, attending, um, in order to connect us up. Would you be prepared as a challenge there for you? Um, because uh, because a small group of people can't do everything ourselves. Thanks, Simon. I'm glad you made the gender point. Are they? Yeah. No, I mean it's really very important. Yeah. Um, we have three more minutes. Does anyone else want to say anything? Hi, Cindy. Yes. Oh, hi, Ariana. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Ariana. Sorry, I can't find the uh, raise your hand button. <laughs> and bits, uh, the electricity keeps getting cut out today, so I hope I don't get cut out. Um, thanks a lot for the really interesting story, Simon, about this moment of uh, possibility and, and um, the history of, of Southern African historical cinema, uh, you know, in this post-independence moment um, um i wonder you know and a lot of a discussion now is centered the archives and kind of recuperating these archives and and uh, preserving them but it seems to me that the question of access is also quite central and the story that you tell um is partly uh, perhaps the story around the private privatization of film archives that have closed down on the, the kind of this initial moment of possibility uh, and collaboration between filmmakers across the region uh, to make new films, etc. So yes, uh, what what has the uh, uh, impact of uh, privatization of archives uh, been on uh, this film movement in Southern Africa? Um, and then I had another question, um, uh, something that relates to um, some of the bigger international um, connections uh, that you had at the time and, and perhaps influences on uh, this movement in Southern Africa beyond the Pan-African frame that you referred to. Thanks a lot. I hope Thanks, you got me. Thanks, it doesn't matter. Simon, can you give an answer in one minute? <laughs> um. Yeah, well, for the time being, what's the interesting thing is a quite uh, the privatization of archive. Yes, of course, that's kind of going to be a, a problem because you can imagine many private filmmakers sitting on their archive um, in case um, they're not getting the buck that they want for it. Or, you know, it's filmmakers, uh, as I know from myself are interesting bunch of creatures, really. Um, so that is that is a problem. It won't be a problem in relation to this particular initiative um, at, up until the mid-1990s and early 2000s. <clears throat> and I think that we will be able to get enough private 
owners of archives to subscribe, to give sense of the regional um, film, transnational film initiative. Um, you know, I think that uh, uh, certainly I, I will contribute the media's archives to that. Doesn't mean to say I'm not going to charge money for archive, but I'm very willing to lodge it all in Zimbabwe if they have an appropriate structure that will be accessible to people. And in any case, as a private person, if my films are digitized by the National Archives of Zimbabwe or wherever that arc, that digitizing center is going to be, um, I will have a digital copy. And that, in a sense, that effectively what we're offering is free digitization. I mean, I'm offering, I don't have any budget or anything like that, but the vision, free digitization, you get a copy, you can then sell it how you want, but you get publicity through this general Southern African um, website. Um, so that could help. I didn't really, Ariana, get your point about the international import, excepting that I think there's, and I totally understand because I was part of it in a way, um, the effort to create this national identity of and film like national national flag, um, national anthem is all part of it. But um, in actual fact, if you look at West African film, um, you look at the financing, you look at the crews, um, though they might have produced marvelous visions um, of the particular uh, film. Jibril Mambate, for example, Tuki Buki. If you look at the crews, if you the, the key for advice to academics is look at the credits of a film. The credits are the um, the accurate footnotes of any film. And so, if you look at those credits, you'll see even for something like Tuki Buki, you'll see. Um, Swiss co-producers, uh, French money, uh, um, a French editor, you know, etc. That doesn't make anything less of a West African film. It just means that film is actually a transnational medium. Now, look, Hollywood was created by, wasn't it created? I'm um, corrected, but by some Jewish refugees who went to America and. Uh, at Hollywood. I mean, that's a simplistic version. So um, because film is like a medium that can be distributed widely internationally, it's necessarily, it's, it's necessarily a transnational, it's an international, it's a global thing, film. So um, that, and, 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 and that is what uh, I, I, I feel um, without being a total expert, academia has missed. Thanks for pointing out our weaknesses to us, Simon. <laughs> we shall do our best to improve. Um, I think I'm going to have to bring this seminar to a close, but um, just note that Emma sent us some details which may tell us more about the restoration of Hansula. And then Tabiso actually wants to know more about your work, Simon, so perhaps you could communicate with him after the seminar. Um, he's particularly interested in Bira music, Spirit of the People, that you mentioned. And, I mean, there's a lot more to discuss, obviously. Um, so hopefully this is not the end, but more like a beginning. Thanks very much for bringing this rich paper to us and for showing us those very persuasive and powerful clips. And thanks everyone for attending and looking forward to seeing you again at these seminars, but also book launch remember thanks so much bye thanks for cheering thank you and bye, -bye.